I'm going to be reading this morning from the book of Jonah and um, the fourth chapter. And I would like for you to have this thought in your mind. The Lord had prepared. The Lord had prepared. The Apostle Paul, in his writing to the church in Corinth, said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the hearts of man the, God, the, the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. And we know that God has made preparation for the salvation of each one of us in sending his son here to die upon the cross. We also know that the son, while he was here, said, uh, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. And so God has made a lot of preparations for us down over time. But the interesting one here is that... Uh, we're dealing, we're dealing this morning with a guy who is uh, uh, stubborn, and he's rebellious, and he's not happy. And that wouldn't describe anyone here this morning, but uh, I can certainly tell you that from my experience, there have been some times in my life that I've probably been guilty of all of those. And, and uh, I, I'm reminded then of the... First text that the Lord ever gave me before I'd ever preached my first sermon or attempted to preach my first sermon, I uh, received the text, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I can stand here this morning and tell you that the Lord has kept true to that promise. He has never left me nor forsaken me. Now, I've, I've pulled all kinds of stunts and I've been in all kinds of situations where he should have. Uh, rightfully so. He should have said, you know what? I've had it all out of Kent Parson that I want to tolerate and, and written me off. But he never, ever has done that. And I'm thankful that he hasn't. You're all familiar with the, with the word of the Lord and Jonah and the, in the belly of the whale. Uh, I hope you're familiar with the prayer that he prayed he was there. But, but let me back up a little bit with that and just uh, give you again kind of the background on that. The Lord had come unto Jonah and spoken unto him and he said, I want you to go down to the city of Nineveh and preach to those people or say to those people, uh, yet 40 days, and the city of Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, I want you to do that. And, and of course, when the Lord spoke that unto Jonah, Jonah uh, made up his mind he was not going to do that. Uh, every time the Lord speaks to us, obviously he has a reason in doing that, and he has a purpose in mind for us doing it. But unfortunately, many times we choose not to listen to him. And we make up our minds that we're going to do what we want to do and not what he wants us to do. God is always very clear and very explicit about what he wants. Uh, one of the favorite things that people used to do to kind of cop out was to say, well, I want to be sure it's the Lord. Well, now, you know, if you're a child of God, when the Lord is speaking to you, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. We know the voice of the Lord. And it isn't a question then of whether or not we, we need to be sure. It's a question of whether or not we're going to heed what he says. It's kind of like Joyce was talking earlier here. You know, sometimes we hear, but we don't listen. One of the writers wrote and said, Be not only a hearer of the word, but also a doer of the word. For he that is a hearer and not a doer is like unto a man that beholdeth himself in a mirror. And when he is gone away, he straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. There's not a single one of you here this morning know exactly how you look right now. You know how you looked when the last time you looked in the mirror. And you know whether you got the hair straight or whether it's not straight, whether the makeup is on right or wrong, however. But there have been circumstances that have come along since then, so you don't really know. You think and you hope, 
but you're not real sure. And I find that all the time, that that's, that's the case. But, but we need not only just be a hearer, but we also need to be a doer of the word. Anyway, the Lord spoke unto Jonah and said, I want you to go down there. And Jonah said, well, I'm going to go, but I'm going to go the other direction. And so he bought him a ticket, went the opposite direction of where the Lord had instructed him to go. And, and you're very familiar, familiar with this portion of the word of the Lord. Whenever that, he uh, got on board the ship, and after they put out to sea, why there was a storm came upon the sea. And, and those men who were professional sailors, they did everything under the sun to save the ship. It was about to be broken up. And they started casting their cargo over. Board. They, they, their livelihood was going overboard. And Jonah, in the meantime, he's gone down in the belly of the ship and gone to sleep. He could have cared less about what was going on down there. And I'm going to tell you this morning that a child of God who's disobedient unto the Lord could care less about anyone else excepting themselves. That, that's all you get. You get caught up in this. And I want, I want you to listen in just a little bit here, and I'm going to tell you a little more about John or John, Jonah's experience here. And I want you to know that sometimes so we may say, oh, you know, I still love everybody, and I'm still love the Lord and everything. Whenever that we get disobedient unto the Lord, all we're thinking about is ourselves. And that's not a very good position to be in, I can assure you that. Jonah goes down, goes to sleep, and they're up here. They're doing everything they can in the sun to save the ship. And finally, they reach the point to where that they've decided, you know, we've got to figure out what is going on. They go down, and they wake Jonah up, and he acknowledges and he admits that he's the problem. And he says to them, you cast me overboard. Just throw me overboard. And they do. And the Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So God had prepared a fish to swallow Jonah up. Now, somebody's going to say, well, you know, it doesn't say then it's a whale. I believe the Bible says in another place that Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. So shall also the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Anyway, you, know, you can get into the big controversy over whether, what, what, what it was, whether it was a big fish or whether it was a whale or what. It's, it, it, it's really immaterial to me. The, the point is, is that God had made preparation for what was going to happen to Jonah. And God knows every single one of your lives this morning. He knows exactly where you are in His walk, in His work, in His service, and you're not fooling Him for a second. You may think, you can fool me, but you're not fooling the Lord for a minute. He knows exactly where you are at all times. I tell people every once in a while, tell the church every once in a while, we sometimes need to stop and just take a good self-examination of ourselves to see where we are in the eyes of the Lord. And if we're honest about it, we know where we are. God does not leave us in darkness as His children. We are in the light. Well, uh, Jonah then, after he's thrown overboard and the fish swallows him up, he prays. He's still able to pray. I'm so thankful that every one of us as a child of God have the privilege of praying. And it is a privilege. We have the privilege to talk to the Lord. But let me tell you, along with the privilege comes some responsibility. And it is not only something that we're privileged to do, we, we desperately need to do probably more praying than what most of us do. But it also can be a very dangerous thing. And I think sometimes God's children lose sight of that, that you know, many times we're asking God for things that we have no business asking for. And sometimes God gives us those things, and then we regret that we have asked them. God's done that all down through time. People are always praying, oh, Lord, do this. Lord, help us see it. And then probably the most common one is that when we get ourselves in a little bit of trouble, we try to negotiate with the Lord. We, we sometimes say, well, Lord, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Well, you don't need to think for a second that you're going to be able to be successful in negotiating with the Lord. His way is right. 
And it's always going to be right. And His will will be done. We just need to understand that. Well, if you remember finally that the, that the uh, prayer's over. <coughs> the fish vomits Jonah up on the dry ground and the word of the Lord comes to him again the second time. And says, I want you to go down unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, I want to tell you this as a preacher, that there are times that people say, oh, I wish you would preach on this. I wish you would preach on that. And there are some times I wish I could preach on those things. But I don't get to do it the way I want to do it. It's not my call. God didn't say, I've called you to preach, and then you just decide what you want to preach on. The thing that I'm called to do, and the thing that He expects me to do, is to preach His Word. Preach His Word. Next week, you're going to hear a charge that will be made uh, to Dennis. You'll hear a charge that will be made to the church. And this, the same charge that was given to the young preacher Timothy will probably be mentioned. I charge thee therefore before the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his coming. Preach the word. Preach the word. That's my responsibility is to preach to you the word. The word. The Lord spoke unto Jonah and said, You go down there and preach the preaching that I bid you. Now keep in mind that when you hear this quoted many times, you will hear people say that Jonah went down there and preached, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. You're going to destroy it. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There is a difference. Sometimes you need to be paying attention to what the scripture says versus what the preacher is saying. They should be the same, but they are not always. And it is very easy for people to be misled. And whether they are being misled deliberately, intentionally, or whether it is unintentionally and certainly not deliberately, deliberately <coughs> depends upon the preacher. I've always insisted that you read the word of the Lord. I, 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 I can make mistakes. I'm very capable of making mistakes. I do not intend to deliberately mislead you. I, I don't want that. There's enough of that already. But it can happen. And so you have the responsibility as a child of God to read and to study the Word. Jonah goes down into the city of Nineveh. He starts in it's three days through the city. A journey's for him. He wasn't allowed to travel so far as they were making it through the city like Nineveh. And so he took three days went through the city saying, Yet forty days and then of us shall be overthrown. And the people, the word of God says, And the people believed God. I've said there is, cannot be any higher a compliment that comes to me or to any other preacher than whenever that we preach the word, the people say, I believe what God said from your preaching. Not that I believe you. You know, it's, it's not important whether you believe me. I'd like for you to believe me because I hope that I'm preaching to you the word of the Lord. But what is important is that you believe what God says in His Word. Goes there and he preaches for three days and the Bible says the people of Nineveh believed what God said and they repented. The king came down from off of his throne. It was went from the lowest of the people there to the highest ranking person in that land. And he came down off of his throne and made a declaration that the people were to repent and they went to the sackcloth and prayed. And the Bible says, and God saw that they were sorry, they repented, and it repented the Lord of that which he said he would do. In other words, he changed his mind. 
He did not overthrow the city at that time. Now, let me be sure that you understand this. Because God changed his mind does mean that it did not come to pass. Because Nineveh was overthrown many, many years later. God's word was kept. He just didn't do it right then. Now listen. Fourth chapter. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now, I preach this sometimes and say this is just typical of a lot of Baptists I've known who, and to use a southern term, they pitch a fit. If something doesn't go to please them, or if they want to get on a little bit of a pity trip, they start in just kind of like Jonah, and they'll pitch a fit. Some of them seem to think that if they do that, kind of like the kid you were talking about this morning, you know, usually... They think, well, if I just pitch a little fit, I'll get away with this. And a lot of times they do. And that's nobody's fault except mom and daddy's. Let's just be honest about it. There's no excuse for that as far as I'm concerned. There's a way to stop that. And our Heavenly Father, He knows exactly how to bring us out of that little temper tantrum that we're in. And sometimes it's a little more severe than what you could get away with as a parent today. But God knows exactly how to take care of the situation. Jonah is mad. He's angry. He's upset. I want you to listen. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. What was he saying? He's saying, I knew this was the way it was going to turn out. I knew this is what was going to happen. I knew that you were a good God and you weren't going to allow this to happen. There are a lot of people who are still preaching and teaching this today. Oh, God's too good to let people go to hell. There's not going to be anybody go to hell. God, God's a God of God, love, God of mercy. God is forgiving God. God, God's going to do all these things. Let me tell you something. He doesn't send a soul to hell. They go there because they choose to go there. And they make that decision while they're here upon the face of the earth. God's made provision. God's prepared everything that is needed for the soul to be saved. There is not one single thing that's missing in that equation that needs to be done to make it, make it possible for a person to be saved. And yet we today, our churches today, our preachers today, our people today say, well, let's add this. Let's put this in there. We're, you know what? We're, we're just putting, we're putting patches on a perfect garment. God's plan is perfect. He doesn't need us to add anything to it. He's already made the provision. It is perfect, people. Oh, you know, well, that, that's not good enough for me. You know, I, I want to be sure they come down there and repent. I want to see them repent. There's not a place in the Scripture that says you need to see them repent. It says they need to repent, but it doesn't say you have to see it. Doesn't say I have to see it. Doesn't say it has to be done in our church. We got people, if it's not in their church, they can't be saved. If they're not doing it the way they're supposed to be doing it, and the way they think they're supposed to be doing it, well, obviously they're not saved. That's not in the scripture either. But now listen, Jonah, he's mad, he's upset, he's got a burr under his tail. He says, and he prays to the Lord. I very well remember it. I can share with you this morning a personal experience and knowing exactly how Jonah felt. When I was lost, seeking the Lord, my good pastor would come by, it was in the altar service, you know. Jim would come by every little bit. Son, he didn't just do this for me. I've seen him do it a hundred. Well, I started to say a thousand. I'm probably closer to a thousand than I am a hundred of seeing him do this. But he'd come by and he'd say, Son, anything you need to do, anything we can do to help you. Now, I'm down on my knees with my head down the altar. Now, I can't see him doing this walk, but I, I, in, in my mind I can because I've seen him do it enough times since. And you know, one time he comes by and I said, I need to pray. And that's just what I said. That's what I thought. I need to pray. Man, I was lost seeking the Lord. Well, all right. 
He said, we'll pray. Everybody will. Just come on, gather here in the altar. Kent needs to pray. And Karen, I'm telling you the truth if I ever told it, and I know most people think I've got to be lied by now, but I'm not. He gets all these people up there in the altar and gets down. He says, all right, son, go ahead. <laughs> if my life depended on it, I could not say one word. I couldn't say a word. I couldn't get anything to come out. Not one single sound could I get to come out. Jim's, you know, he's, he's been here long enough that pretty soon he picks it up and he starts praying. And boy, I'm mad. I'm mad and upset, humiliated, embarrassed. And I said, I got all of these people up here told I needed to pray and I didn't say a word. I, who was I mad? I was mad at the Lord. You know, I was mad because I knew that I felt like I needed to pray and I couldn't pray. And I didn't hesitate to let him know. Well, that didn't get me saved, but it didn't keep me from being saved either. Let me tell you something. God's not going to disown you because that you're not paying attention to Him or that you're being disobedient to Him or that you're pitching a little fit. But I'll guarantee you one thing. He knows exactly how to take care of everything. Bible says, so Jonah, he's upset. He's praying and says, Lord, I knew this is exactly what was going to happen. I hear this from God's people all the time. Oh, there's no use for me to go see this one. No use for me to say anything to that one because I already know what they're going to do. God didn't tell you that you were supposed to be able to know what the result was going to be. We spend too much of our time worrying about the results instead of taking care of the business that God tells us to. It's not my job to get the message out to you. God takes care of that. My job is to preach His Word as He gives it to me. I can't do it without Him. I can't even preach it without Him. But as He gives it to me, I'm one of those that He has called to preach His Word, and I have that responsibility to preach His Word. But it's not my responsibility as to what you do with it. That's your responsibility. Be not only here, but also a doer. Anyway, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Oh, Lord, have I heard that so many times. Oh, I don't know why the Lord just don't let me die. I'm no good to Him. That's a pity trip, folks. You're feeling sorry for yourself. First of all, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not paying attention to what the Lord told you to do. And then you turn around and you're crying about how useless you are. You'd be useful if you'd pay attention to what the Lord said. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? Do you think you're doing well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Now there's the next step. I, I, I said I had a little extra time. I'm going to use it all this morning, I guess. Here he is. He's mad. The Lord's asking, do you think you're doing well to be angry? Oh, Jonah, he doesn't even answer. He said, I'll just get up and go out here and I'll just sit out there on the side and watch to see what's going to happen. Yeah, that sounds typical of a Baptist. I'm mad, I'm upset, I didn't get my way, and I'm not going to do anything except to go out here and just sit there and wait and pout until I see what's going to happen. I'm not going to do anything. I'll just go out there and sit there and watch. Now listen. <coughs> and the Lord God prepared a gourd. God prepared something. He prepared a fish swallow him up and now Jonah's out here on the hillside and the Bible says and the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief so Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd I can just, I can just see this in my mind's eye here he is he's out here he's all upset and all of a sudden here comes this little useless Good for nothing, gourd vine coming up out of the ground that God 
had placed there. And as he looks at it, it's very similar to what Eve saw when she was in the Garden of Eden. The longer he watched that little gourd grow, the more attached to it he became. And he was so happy that this gourd vine had come up and was giving him some shade here. And he's so proud of that gourd. Oh, man, I'm, I'm sure he must have cared very carefully for it. And he was so it was so important to him that he's got this little gourd here right now. But now listen, but God prepared a worm. God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. I can relate to this. I from time to time and year to year plant tomato plants only to go out one morning and find that the doggone tomato worms have taken care of all that work that I went to and they can do it so quickly. By the Bible says that the Lord had prepared a worm. The Lord prepared the gourd. The Lord done this. Prepared then a worm that came up and chewed the vine and it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Now then the Lord, after the vine has died, the Lord prepares a, 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 a wind that comes up and, it's, and Jonah's about to have now, a, we'd probably say, a sunstroke today. He's all, he said, just be better for me to die. Well, then die. And that's what you'd probably say today. Oh, just be better for me to die. Oh, Elijah said the same thing when Jezebel threatened to kill him. He said, Lord, just let me die. I've said a lot of times, well, why didn't he just stay there? Jezebel, Jezebel was going to accommodate him, but he ran for his life. Sometimes we say things and we don't know more meaning than anything under the sun. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Yes, I do. I, I have a right to be angry about that little gourd that I just thought was so much of out there, you know. Man, he forgot that God had given him that gold, had prepared it. But it was important to him. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? The Lord said to Jonah, you know what, Jonah, you've been so thoughtful and so conscientious and so faithful to that gourd that came up in a night and perished in a night. And yet, there are 12,000 people in that city that don't know their left from their right hand, and I spared them. And that gourd meant more to you than those people. Does you well to be angry? Let me tell you something in closing. You can have your little pity trip. You can have your little anger fit. You can be disobedient unto the voice of the Lord. But I'm going to guarantee you this one thing. God's work will go on. His word will be carried out. And you have the choice as to whether you want to be a part of that being fulfilled or whether you want to be a hindrance to it. But let me assure you, God will get the job done. And if you don't want to do it, it's your call. You'll be the loser. You'll be the one who will suffer. But he will then get the job done. He's always got somebody that he can take to get it done.